than during the rest of recorded history combined. Um, And basically what he's saying is the 20th century uh, was just an explosion of history. Okay. Um, And this is also true of Baptists and especially Southern Baptists. Okay. I know that that's a, it's a big statement, but um, I think the sentiment is true. Okay. That so much has happened in the 20th century that it's even hard for us to see the impact of all of those things. And, and a lot of it is because we've lived through it. We experienced it. So we don't really analyze it or internalize it as to the impact and the history of what we just went through. Okay. Um, And in a, in a couple hundred years, people might go, this was a crazy time, you know, and, and talk about, look at the impact and what it's done for us today. Okay. But when you're living through it, it's not so, I mean, we don't, we don't really see it. It's just, it's just common for us. Right. Um, so, and I think that that's the sentiment of what he's saying is we don't understand the time that we're living in and how much history is taking place or has taken place because yeah, our parents talked about it or our grandparents, and then we're living through this and we don't, we don't necessarily unsee or we don't necessarily see the events unfolding that are going to impact a hundred years from now. Okay, so that's the sentiment of what's going on. Now, the reason I'm telling you that is because so much has happened since 1900 that it's impossible to cover it all. Um, And it's impossible to say how it affects our daily life. So what we're going to do is we're going to pull highlights out. And so here's, here's my promise to you, okay? I plan on having this study done next month. Because in, in September, August or September, I want to start something else. I want to go into something else, okay? Over the summer, we usually take a break. We might go through a video or something, but I want to go in depth in something else, okay? So for, for, for what we're going to do over the next several weeks is we're going to hit a lot of the highlights and things that you experienced and you went through, but may have never said, wow, I didn't know that that really impacted what we've done. And so um, that's what we're going to do over the next several weeks. And one of the things, um, so let's ask this question. What do you think has more happened to Baptists in the last 120 years than has occurred in all of Baptist history before? <laughs> well, like I got, well, I just wanted to get your reaction to what I just said. Maybe, 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 maybe you're like, oh, I think you're, I think that's not true. I think uh, it doesn't really seem that way. I just, I'm just asking for your reaction, I guess. So what do you think? I would guess, I would say yes. A lot. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. So there's more people to impact. So there's more things going on. Okay. Um, so technologies have impacted. Yeah. Why, why do you why do you bring in liquor laws? I don't want to no. <laughs> oh, well, we don't anymore. Baptists used to, but we don't now. Prohibition, um, which we're not going to cover. By the way, that's just a little. I think we're just um, we're talking um, of events or things that have happened, whether great or small, that have 
impacted history to, to some degree. I mean, and now keep in mind, if we're just going to do Baptist history, that goes back to uh, the 1500s, if you want to if you want to count the Anabaptists in that. But if you want to um, just say, well, 1611, Thomas Elwes started the first Baptist church, and that's where we start. Um, that's still, you know, from the 1600s, 300 years, more has happened in the last 100 years than the 300 years prior to it. Um, I would say that significant changes... Um, especially to how Baptists react to one another, have really happened in the last 100 years. Um, and and the, the branches of Baptists um, have changed a lot in the last 100 years. So the first thing that we're going to start is, we're going to look at, so after the turn of the century, Baptists focused more on large projects. So remember before it was the Home Mission Board that was pushing things west, Okay, um, 1900s were still moving west, but we've already been to California now. Okay, they're settling California. So we've pretty much covered from ocean to ocean, right? And so um, the, the country is pretty much established. Um, and there's still work, there's still Native Americans, there's still... Um, uh, missions to be to to work through and and different things going on and you know the early 1900s were still a, a western style you know cowboys and Indians and horses and you know wagons and stuff like that but things are going to start changing right um, pretty quickly so Baptists kind of focused on larger projects World War One brought about a sense of wanting to focus more on world needs okay so. World War I was a war like no other, um, where more countries participated in a war than um, had ever happened before. Most, most skirmishes were between two countries, um, and maybe you bring in a third to help out one or you know, something like that. But this was a massive, Europe is in war, okay, between a whole bunch of countries. America gets involved. Other things um, are going on. So it brought a sense that well, we can impact the world, okay? So now we're at that stage where we as a group can impact the entire world. Um, so the SBC wanted to focus more on world missions and needed a way to fund those missions and build a stronger foreign mission board. So they, were, they're, they're, they had pushed a lot for the home mission board. Remember prior to the 1900s, late 1800s, moving into the 1900s, early 1900s, they were making a push toward, um, toward home missions. So 1917 is when World War I happens. Um, they start to go, well, we can impact the whole world. Okay, so the men and millions movement had raised $6 million. That's the disciples, okay? Church of Christ. We're going to do world missions. They had pledged $6 million. The Methodist Century Fund pledged and raised, or pledged $115 million in 1916. The New Era Movement, $13 million put out by the Presbyterians in 1918. So all of these denominations start these pledge drives. How can we affect world missions? The SBC launched its 75 million campaign in 1919. We're going to go 75 million is the plan. So they, the SBC says, hey, things are going on. We, we can impact world missions. What can we do? We think, as, as that committee is gathering there, they're saying, we think that we can raise $75 million from the United States to go and do world missions. We're going to make a campaign. The SBC took pledges from Baptists to be paid from 1919 to 1924. And they said, we're going to raise $75 million 
send missionaries, start building churches. We're going to go around the world to establish uh, Baptists around the world. Okay? So at this time, uh, European Baptists are starting a major decline. Okay? Uh, European Baptists had started to, uh, especially in England, had started to conform more to the Anglican church and starting to do those sort of things. So in England and Europe, Baptists are on a major decline. So the, so- the, Southern, Mission, uh, the, the Southern Baptist Convention says, we think we can impact the rest of the world we raised $75 million. Now, $75 million is a ton of money in 1919, okay? So, I mean, I mean, we may say, well, $75 million, we still say $75 million is a lot of money, but just think of the impact that that could be in 1919 to raise $75 million. So this is the push to raise $75 million. The Campaign Commission came up with a plan. The most intense publicity and publication that Southern Baptists had ever seen followed. We're going to get raised $75 million. How are we going to do that? Well, this was the plan they set up. July is preparation. We're going to start preparing our people. We're going to get ready for it. This is 1919. We're going to start getting ready. August, we're going to start sending out the information. This is what we're doing. We're going to tell our churches what we're doing. We're going to enlist pastors. We're going to enlist lay members. We're going to enlist people. And we're going to start giving them information about what we can do, what we can impact, how we can impact the rest of the world if we raise this kind of money. September, intercession. We want all of you to pray for it. We're going to tell every church, month of September, we want people fasting, we want people praying, we want people on their knees, we want people, uh, this is in their daily prayers, this is in their daily walk. We're praying that the Southern Baptist Church can raise $75 million to impact world missions, to spread the gospel. October, we start enlisting people. We're going to get people in. Who are the people that are going to help us do this? Who are the people who are going to start saying this and speaking these things and going around and telling people? November is stewardship. You're going to make the commitment. The people are going to make the commitment on how much they're going to give, how much they're going to pledge. And then December 1st through the 7th will be victory week. We're going, everyone is going to put in their pledge and send it to us. And we're going to know exactly how much each person has pledged to give. And we're, and our goal is that the pledges will equal $75 million. That's the plan. Okay. So in 1919, coming out of the convention, this is what they decided to do. And this is how they pushed it forward. During those months, pastors would preach on how the campaign would strengthen the SBC and world missions. So pastors are getting up in the pulpit. They're the people that have been enlisted. There are people going to help. They're going to tell their congregations, listen, this pledge is going on. I want you to pledge. We're going to give to this. And we're going to impact the world through missions which is not a new concept for Baptists, right? William Carey, right? He wants to go impact the world. Lottie Moon, we have these stories. We know who these people are, okay? At this point in time, we know who these people are, okay? But we, as Baptists, can now raise $75 million to help people like that, to send out other people like that, to go to all the countries rather than just India and China. We can we can start focusing a world campaign rather than a focused on a one location campaign. Lay members were trained to give four minute speeches on the campaign, a practice adopted from the Liberty Bond drives. So uh, I don't know much about that. That's a little bit before my time. It's 1919. Um, But um, I have seen the movie Captain America where he's going around pushing bonds. Uh, for World War II, at least. 
But I guess in World War I, they were going around pushing bonds. People would buy the bonds. This is, they would go around. They would give these little speeches. This is why you need to buy a bond to help uh, your country. So buy a bond and help your country. So Baptists said, we can do that. So they adopted this. They enlisted lay members, uh, deacons, people like that to say they're going to go place to place. They're going to stop start doing, train them in these four four minute speeches that they can give because we can raise $75 million dollars to go out into the world. By the end of victory week, pledges had totaled, what do you think? No, $200 or $200 million? $200? No, this is what we got. $92,630,930,923. Was, it is over. Yes, it is over. So the pledges came in at, at a high, higher than what was told. However, agricultural prices were driven up by World War I, but dropped sharply in 1920. Who are Southern Baptists? Most of them are farmers. Uh, most of them are uh, in the South. They're farmers. They deal with agriculture. Um, and prices dropped in 1920. By 1922, half a million new believers had come into the SBC and knew nothing of the campaign. So now you're filling your churches with people who aren't giving. What's that going to do to the people who are? I have this, I've, three years ago I made a pledge. Jody's come in since then. He's not putting anything towards this pledge. Why do I have to do it? Okay. So, uh, new believers are coming in and they didn't continue the pledge drive with them hey, would you like to help with world missions? That's all it took. But they didn't do it. Many Baptists who moved considered their pledges canceled. So I've got to relocate because agricultural prices, well, they don't expect me to pay that pledge, do they? Because of the pledges, collections declined in many churches. So you pledged, uh, I'm going to pledge uh, $50 a month. I don't know what people, $50 a month. Well, we passed the plate around to keep the lights on at the church and you've just given $50 to go. Are you going to give an extra another 10% to the church? Probably not. Okay. So because the pledges, collections declined. By the end of the campaign in 1924, the SBC had collected $58,591,713.69. Nobody had a penny to just throw in and make it up to 70. That, that really affects my OCD. Okay, nobody had uh, 31 cents to bring it up to an even uh, 714. Nope. This, was the, this is what they collected. So, do you think it was a success or a failure? So you see it as a success? Hey, you had zero and now you have 58 million. Or 59, or whatever, if you want to round up. 59. I would call it a success. Success? Okay. Um... Yeah, and in most things, we would. We would say, wow, that's a success. Um, yeah, we, 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 we were shooting for 75. Uh, we didn't get it. Um, so, yeah, it's a success. We got 58 million to impact world missions. Could we do a lot for world missions with 58 million? Yeah, we can. The percentage of collection was far better than the other denominations. Remember, um, the Methodists had declared 115 million. 
they didn't they didn't get it, they didn't get close to that. I don't know what the numbers were, but the percentage of what the Baptists brought in was higher um, than what the Methodists brought in. Okay, so what the others had pledged uh, was higher. However, many of the SBC institutions borrowed money based on those pledges. We pledged 92 million. Guess what we can do? We can borrow money to expand this agency. We can borrow money to uh, grow certain aspects. We can hire people for this money that's coming in. Institutions like Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary borrowed money based on those pledges. Okay? Now what happens when you hit just a little over half of what you thought was coming in? So they, they pledged 92 million given 58. Okay? So you're 40 million shy. I'm, I'm using very round numbers. I got that. Okay? So, what happens? Well, they, are, uh, they already borrowed the money. Many of the SBC agencies were plunged into debt. They've got a problem because now we didn't hit the budget, we didn't hit the pledge mark, and some of these agencies who borrowed money and expanded, hired people, Money didn't come in. In 1928, the Home Mission Board treasurer embezzled a little over 900000 which caused many to lose faith in the SBC. Okay? In 1929, the stock market crashed and the SBC found itself in financial trouble. Why? Because all those debts have to come in. They got to be paid. Okay? And in 1928, you got a guy that walks out with a million of it. Think he saw that coming? I think he saw it coming. This financial, this is about to collapse. Okay? He can get the money. He took it. Okay? So, financially, the SBC's in trouble. Um, the SBC is, is experiencing some downturn. They didn't get the money. They borrowed money based on that money that's supposed to come in. It didn't come in. Um, yeah, we raised $58 million, so that's good, but it's not, um, it's not what they had expected. Then you have a guy in 1928 who um, embezzles the money, stock market crashes, so... Now we're going into the 30s in financial trouble. Um, I didn't put this in the slides, but I will say that the SBC did tighten its belt and they started another campaign to be uh, debt-free by 43. And they did it. They paid off their debts. They raised the money to pay off their debts. So... Um, that what was by a few guys that saw that we're in trouble, and so they did. They 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 fixed the problem. Okay, so, but, however, in 1920, when the 75 million campaign was announced, the SBC didn't seem to think it was a one and done campaign. Because they did something at that meeting. Um, or in 19, it was announced in 1919. In 1920, the next year, when they decide, well, this is what we're going to do with that money. Okay? So it's to be paid from 1919 to 1924. So in 1920, when they're hoping that all of these pledges are going to come in, they know what it is. December told them that they're going to 
get $92 million. So in 1920, at that annual meeting, they did something. The Conservation Committee laid out a permanent convention financial plan. And what they did was the cooperative program was set up and finalized in 1925. And here's how it worked. So they said, we need a permanent financial plan. We don't think that Baptists are going to stop giving. We're going to ask them to give. We think they're going to continue to give. So we're, we need to set up a plan for when they give. And what they came up with was probably the greatest financial decision that any religious organization ever made. And I say that biasly, I know. But they said, we're going to give, we're going to call it the cooperative program and we're going to set it in motion and here's how it works. Churches would send their collections for denominational ministries to the state convention. So the churches are going to take what they need to survive and they're going to take the rest and they're going to give it to the state for denominational ministries. So the state convention then would retain a portion of funds for work within the state. So you're, we're, they're going to help basically the work that the home mission board says, this is what we're going to do. Okay, so the state is going to take, they're, they're going to take a percentage of what the churches send uh, to the state. The state would forward the rest to the SBC and the executive committee made up of representatives from each state would recommend the amount that would go to each agency to be finalized by a vote at the convention meeting. So church is going to pay its money. They're going to take a collection of its people. They're going to take their percentage that they need to survive, which continually goes up and up because guess what? We have electricity now. Um, and uh, we have running water. We have to pay for all those. Well, we don't have to pay for running water, but other churches do. So there's things that have to be paid for. So they're going to take their percentage. They're going to take the rest and give it to, um, to the state, which we give... Uh, 26% in total? Well, we used to. And, and now we, we, we set aside 10% for us and 13%, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I know it works a little bit differently now. Okay. But this was the, this was the plan when they did it. So they would take that. So they would take the 10% or whatever they could and they would send it to the state. The state gets that money. They would skim a little, they would take their part, I skim a little, that sounds bad, but they would take their, their percentage and then send the rest off to, um, to the, 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 the national convention who would then use its delegates who are voted on by each state to spend that money in the agencies that it needed to be spent in. Okay, that's their plan. And the cooperative program was, has brought Southern Baptists together and is considered the lifeline of Southern Baptist ministries. Put it in quotes because that's what it says. That's what people say. Southern Baptists, if it's not for the cooperative program, goes bankrupt. But because the way they organized it, when they saw that money coming in, and they said, we think this is going to continue to come in, we're going to set up a plan to take that money and put it where it needs to go. So the old way of raising money, which I guess I didn't put in my animations, the old way of raising money was based on emotion and importance. So how would they do that? You come in, Lottie Moon writes a letter, says, hey, I've got this. I need you to help me. So the church would support a missionary, okay? This, the cooperative program allowed less glamorous agencies and causes to have funding. 
So the ones that people are like, oh, it doesn't sound fun. You know what sounds fun? China sounds fun, right? The, the, the soup kitchen down the road, that doesn't sound fun. China sounds fun. India sounds fun. I want to hear those missions. I don't want the guy from down the road tell me how he fed Bob this week, right? I want to know what's going on in the country. So in other countries. So it allowed them to say, hey, we can give local missions. We can give these things. We can give behind the scene ministries, those things. We can give them money. It allowed only a fraction of the collection to go to administration while under the old way, most monies were raised for administration. So under the home mission board, what are you going to do? Well, we're going to send out these people, but most of your money is actually going to go toward administration. We've got to pay people to do this. We've got to organize this thing. We've got to keep this thing going. That takes money. And so here's what it costs to function. Anything extra goes to missionaries. Okay. What this allowed is saying, you have to, you have to function off of the money that the people are going to say you have to function off of. The rest of it is going to go to your causes. Okay, so, so it allowed a fraction. Churches are actively participating in all the ministry rather than just one or two portions of ministry. So the, the church is giving, that giving is going into a pot, that pot is getting dispersed. Whereas before, the, the missionaries might be supported by a church. Okay, so the church, even Southern Baptist did this, where we'll support that missionary or we'll send off to that missionary. Um, and, but we don't participate in this. Okay, we don't participate in doing this part because all of our money is, we'd like to participate, but all of our money is going over there. By giving to the cooperative program, we can say, hey, our church impacts this, 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 and this. Okay, because we give right? The cooperative program brought, brought churches together in cooperation and independent Baptists received severe criticism. So what that did is churches that were functioning outside of the Southern Baptist Convention started to get criticized. Well, you're part of it, but you're not part of it. Do you give to the cooperative program? No, we don't give to the cooperative program. You shouldn't be a part of us. They, they received severe criticism, okay? Which caused a lot of the missionary Baptist churches who are participating in the Southern Baptist Convention to go, I guess we're going to give to the cooperative program. I'll give you a for instance. The church I pastored in Bakoshi was a missionary Baptist church when they were incepted in 1906. Okay? But later switched to Southern Baptists. This is probably the reason why. Well, we're going to give to the cooperative program. So they're no longer an independent missionary Baptist church. They're a Southern Baptist church. Okay. Whereas I think this church started in the 60s, started as a Southern Baptist church because all of this stuff had already happened. Okay. So, um, so it, it, what it did is it brought churches together. It, it brought them uh, to interact. So what might be some of the drawbacks to the cooperative program? What do you think? Okay. Well, luckily, you don't have to come up with them because history already did that for you. <laughs> Pastors are less likely to preach on causes that the cooperative program supports. Before, they were preaching on things. Hey, we got to give to China. We got to give to this. We got to give. We got to be a part of this. This is something our church can do. This is something we can do. But instead, they started to preach uh, other messages, which is fine. I'm not, I'm not giving... Uh, a yay or nay to this. I'm just saying, I rarely preach on Southern Baptist causes, right? I come and I bring you doctrine or 
um, we, we talk about a scripture verse or we go through a, a book or something like that. We just, or we talk about prayer, you know. Um, but rarely are we talking about the causes of, of what the Southern Baptist Convention is doing and what the cooperative program is giving money to. Contributors tend to think that they give to rather than give through. They seem to think the cooperative program is an end to itself. We give to the cooperative program. Okay? We give to the cooperative program. The cooperative program then goes and supports ministries in China, ministries in India, ministries down the road. Instead of we contribute to China, we contribute to India, we contribute to the ministry down the road. It was, it, 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 it took it away from the church actively knowing what they're giving to and uh, focused on certain ministries because the cooperative program then uh, is taking that money and dispersing based on the messengers that you send to the state convention or to the, not just the state convention, but to the national convention as well. Okay. And then there are committees that you've elected as an Oklahoman. You, you can participate in electing to those committees and saying, yes, we want this person from Oklahoma to be on this executive committee because they're going to represent us as a church. We kind of lost touch with all that, right? Because of what the cooperative program did. We're not as active as churchgoers as prior to the 1920s Baptists were in giving to missions and being excited about what's going on in a certain place. Because we give to the cooperative program rather than we give through the cooperative program. So states have often threatened to withhold funds from the SBC when things do not go their way. You're not going to do it the way we want? We won't send the money from the state. We'll just keep it. So if Oklahoma, which we don't, but if Oklahoma decided to uh, say, well, we're not going to send our money off to the, because um, we give to the cooperative program, we give to the state, the state could say, you know what? We're not going to give to the uh, national convention because we wanted one thing and they did another. And most of the time, it's usually not the right thing, right? It's we didn't get our way. Um, you know, Illinois outvoted us and we didn't want that. So we don't like what they do, those northerners, right? So um, because of the cooperative program, states have done that. Well, we're, we're going to withhold. We're not going to give to you because... Um, the goal was 50-50 between states and SBC, but in many cases, the states have retained 65% or more. So the goal was what the church sends to the state, the state will take 50% and send 50% off to um, the national convention. Okay? And then... But what happened was states went, we have our own things to fund. And it ended up taking more and more of a percentage. And in some states, it's even 65% that the state keeps and sends 35 off to the national convention. Okay. So these are some of the drawbacks that have come from uh, the, the cooperative program. So let's... Uh, so in what ways do you think the cooperative program has been a good thing? Let's ask that. Good way to centralize funding. It is. It's a good way to uh, make sure you're not stranding missionaries out in the middle of a mission field. They don't have to come back and beg for money. Yeah, they don't have to come back every year to their churches and beg for money, right? Um, 
Although we're starting to see a lot of that. Missionaries coming into churches that are extracurricular, you know, that don't, aren't supported by the cooperative program. They come to your church. Hey, will you support us? For instance, I'm part of an organization, Touch India Ministries, that does that. They're not part of the SBC at all. Okay? So they have to solicit funds the old-fashioned way. Will you as a church support us? Okay? Um, so, yeah, it is, it is a good way to centralize funds, to not strand missionaries. I think it is a good way for uh, churches to be active and participate in world missions and things that are going on um, and say, especially if we can get around that we give to instead of through. Like if we say, hey, we, we give to China. We, we're really excited about the ministry in China. We give to that. You know, we're really excited about what's going on. If we could, but a lot of it, churches lost excitement uh, in mission work and what was going on. Um, which is in what ways might it have been a bad thing? So what, what do you think? You're like, you just did that list. I can tell you. Show me that list and I'll tell you. What do you think? What do, what do you think might be some others? Well, just the fact that preachers don't preach on it anymore. As women, we get the Mission Mosaic magazine, so we know where needs are around the world as we read through the magazine every month. And maybe we need to highlight some of those stories to the whole church. Okay. Yeah. I think one thing that's going around a lot today is, you know, <clears throat> individuals that are actually planning churches out of the coffee program may be a little more, what's the word, I guess maybe more liberal than what a lot of the conservative Southern Baptist churches are? Okay. That's, that's, no, yeah. So, so the support can go towards causes that we don't necessarily support. Yeah. Okay. Or agree with. Right? Or agree with, yeah. Um, that's, um, so kind of right now, one of the big things with the North American Mission Board um, uh, there's a group out there called Reform Nam now. I don't, although I don't think that they're still functioning because the guy that started it was running for president of Nam and he lost. Okay, but his big thing was, um, we're giving to money, we're giving money to churches who are ordaining women to be pastors. So we shouldn't be doing that as. A church, because fundamentally Southern Baptists right now don't ordain women, okay? Um, but that, that's his, that was his main push, and, and so he was trying to reform NAM now. I think NAM needs reform for other reasons than that one, more reasons than just that one. But, um, but that, was the, that was the thing. So he felt that North American Mission Board was using cooperative program money to support an ideology or, a, or what he thinks is theologically incorrect. Target? Supporting churches that ordain, yes, they are. And the Southern Baptist Convention is allowing that? So the leadership of the Southern Baptist Convention probably doesn't think like most of its rural churches. which is probably some discussions that we're going to be having pretty soon. And maybe why if any university or institution gets hold of these videos, will never give me a job. Okay. Um, so, um, so it might be, so there, there are some, there are some pros and cons, right? Um, so what do you think the cooperative program and how it functions? Ch church, state, convention. Is it a good system or should it be done differently? Church gives the state. State gives, takes their portion, gives it off to the national convention. I know the C isn't capitalizing church. It just stuck out to me. So what they would say to that, 
and just to play devil's advocate with you for just a moment, is we are following your beliefs because you're the ones that elect these people into the positions that they're in. They're doing it. And you've elected them. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, if you ask me, that's a good system and I'm with you, right? Um, it, it's the same as the national government, right? I still pay taxes, but I don't like where my tax money goes, right? It's funding things that I don't want it to fund, you know? Um, where in that I can say, well, the money I sent off to taxes, however small of a portion that is, you know what? I bought a ball bearing on the tank. That's what I purchased, okay? With my money, they bought a ball bearing on a tank because that's how much they charge for those things, right? Um, so, you know, we can say that. Like, my money didn't go towards these activist groups. My money went to pay for that ball bearing on a tank. Yeah, you know, my money went to pay, um, uh, you know, we have, we have military personnel that are associated with the church. My, my tax money went to their salary, and I'm okay with that. Okay, we can say that as an American. You could say that as a, as a Southern Baptist. Well, look, the money I gave, I'm really behind Mich China. I'm giving because I think money should go to China. The small portion that I myself gave went to China. Other people, maybe their money went to that. But it just all goes into a big pot, right? Same as the American economy, right? So the people that go to conventions, let's say I belong to a mega church, would 20 people be elected to go to convention where here we might get one person to go? So um, <laughs> how it kind of functions now is we get to elect two messengers who get to vote, okay? For each, for each time we pass 250 members in our church, we get another voter, okay? So if we have 350 people who go to church, we get three messengers because we've passed 250 once, okay? So if a church of 6,000, they get more messengers. And then if you're giving exceeds a certain amount of money from your church, you get more, depending on how much money that is, is you get more messengers. So a mega church <coughs> where we would get two messengers because we don't give enough money and we don't have enough people. I don't know how many they get, but we can send two, okay? Quail Springs the biggest church in Oklahoma, Southern Baptist Church in Oklahoma, might get 25. I don't know how many they get. I'm just, I just threw out a random number. Okay. So that's how it works. So the bigger churches in the big cities have more power than... Us. Yeah, because our system functions a lot like the American system where New York gets electoral votes more than Oklahoma because they have more people. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And, and I mean, it's a representative system. It's not perfect, but if you ask me, I think that it's a, a fairly decent system, but you're always going to find people that will embezzle almost a million dollars. Okay. There's always going to be corrupt people somewhere. Uh, any sort of power. I mean, it, it amazes me how much people will strive to, co to just hang on to the most insignificant amount of power. Right? I mean, I've watched churches, not our financial secretary, but I've watched churches where financial secretaries, um, they control the entire budget, which maybe you only have 10 people going to the church, so the budget is extremely small, but they won't let anybody spend that money, they hang on to it, right? They cling to that power. I'm the one that dictates where all the money goes. It's an insignificant amount of power, but people cling to it like crazy. You're always going to find those people. So yes, the system, the system is going to have flaws, but the Southern Baptist Church has said, this is the most biblical system 
that's around. Now that they're a little bit biased on that, the Methodists say that their system is better, but we know who's really right. Okay. So, um, so what do you think of the drawbacks uh, that, that, that there are? That, that, that's a poorly worded sentence right there. So what do you think of the drawbacks to the cooperative program? Here they are. So we, we talked about that. So what, it, what do you think of that? I mean, every, everything's going to have pros and cons. What do you think of those cons? And you hit on it a little bit about the preachers. But uh, what, what do you think? Do you think there should be maybe more information where preachers are preaching more? Now, remember, if you answer this question, yes, you're talking directly at me. <laughs> but... Um, because I, I'm, I agree with you. I, I think that we, we should, but to be honest, I get bombarded with so many different things that it's hard to know where the cooperative money is going right now. I mean, because there's so many outlets for that money. There's so many places it's going, right? Um. We could. We could do that. And, right. 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 No, I think that's a good idea to say, hey, what, what can we do to start getting people focused on the mission that they are giving to um, and let people know um, cause right now churches are also going through this problem where people just aren't giving because they don't know why they should have to give to a church. You know, they don't know what happens to their money when they give it. Now we put out a financial report, but how many people read financial reports and go, Hmm, that's ah, I like that. Or that's, you know, most people probably just are like, okay, uh, wow, we gave that much money. What does that go to? They don't even know what that's going to. Or something like that. You know, you're talking like three to five minutes on a, on a Sunday. Right, right. No, I wouldn't. So maybe, maybe we should. Um, um, I, 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 so um, I, I think the top two are actually very important. That... Um, Right, because the state committee, that's just petty. But that, that's a drawback because now the states think that, well, they have some sort of power to say, hey, we're not. And, and if it's for a good thing, like if the SBC is, if they know that they're, they're, they're defrauding people, okay, they're taking that money and putting it in their pockets or something, then the states should be able to go, hey, we're not going to give to that because the president of the SBC, uh, he had a, you know, uh, he had a good pastor's job where he's making $60,000 a year and then he took the SBC and now the guy's worth $14 million. There's a problem, right? So uh, not that that's happened. That hasn't happened. So, and it's currently not happening. Uh, but what I'm saying is, you know, if that were to happen, then yeah, sure, the states should be able to say, hey, we're, we're just not going to send that off. So yes, it is a drawback, but most of the time it's been, it's petty. Like we want to keep more. Hey, you, you should give your percentage. We're keeping it. We're just not going to give you any. Okay. Um, our state, I, I'll say that I, I honestly, I should have looked into it. I don't know the percentage that our state gives, but I will say this. Oklahoma is the most well-funded state convention in the United States. Our state convention is stronger than any other state. Part of that comes from that we have the world's largest Christian camp and we're raising people up to give to the state. Okay, so Falls Creek being what it is, you know, how did, how did James Lankford win 
his, when he ran for the house. Well, he had influenced a generation of voters because he was at Falls Creek and he was the president. He was, he was a very centralized and people knew who he was. And now they're voting and they're like, I know that guy. So they vote for him. You know, I heard a newscast like, how did he win? He wasn't the most funded. He didn't have more money than who he ran against for the house. But they, they go, well, when you have that kind of influence, you know. So Falls Creek does have its benefits, okay? Um, also, uh, we just, we have a lot of strong Southern Baptists. People say, well, we're in the Bible Belt. Well, Oklahoma is the buckle of the Bible Belt. You know, we're, we're the epitome of Southern Baptists, okay? This is where Southern Baptists are the strongest, is here in Oklahoma. We have more Southern Baptist churches per capita than any other state. So we're strong here, okay? Um, I don't know what the percentage is. I would, I would probably say that it's 50-50 because I, I think that there would be a fuss if the, if the strongest, most well-funded convention, state convention was withholding from the national convention. I think the national convention would have something to say about that. Um, so I, I, I would imagine that it's 50-50, but I might be wrong on that. Um, so, but, but then you get a state like, say, Alaska, which only has a few Baptist churches, uh, Southern Baptist churches, which I've attended one um, in Alaska. All right. In Anchorage. Oh, Fairbanks. Okay. Hillside. Okay. That's fun. I don't think that's the one I attended. I attended one in Anchorage, but, um, but anyway, um, but so, you know, for them to do state stuff, it, they may need to withhold a little bit higher of a percentage to affect that state. So anyway, um, uh, this is, this is the cooperative program, uh, good or bad. This is the, the history of that. So uh, we're going to be done and uh, uh, hope you kind of saw how the cooperative program, which is probably the greatest thing that has impacted Southern Baptist in the early 1900s. It's probably the most influential thing out of everything that we're going to talk about after this. The cooperative program is probably the biggest thing. All right, so we'll pray and be dismissed. Father God, we thank you for this time that you give to us, Lord. We thank you that, uh, that we can study our history. We can look at how people who were, came before us were faithful to serve you and, and how they conceived uh, methods and ways to give to your kingdom and to support your kingdom growth, Lord. We know that it doesn't go to just support Baptists. It goes to support the kingdom and bringing people into your kingdom, Lord. We thank you and we praise you for all that you do and all that you have done for us, Lord. We, we ask these things in your son's precious name. Amen.